In this video, we will be taking a look at the ISO performance of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. If you've seen my video on the original Pocket and its ISO, this video will have a very similar structure to that video, except we this time also have to factor in the dual native ISO of the camera. And what ISOs do we still maintain acceptable noise levels? How does ISO affect dynamic range? And how does the dual native ISO of the camera factor into this? The Pocket 4K has two sets of ISO circuits on the camera. The low base, which is native at ISO 400, and the high base, which is native at ISO 3200. If you're using an ISO between 100 and 1000, you're using the low base. Once you go up to ISO 1250, the camera switches over to the second circuit, and you're now using the high base, which is native at ISO 3200. When shooting in RAW, you can actually change the ISO in POST, but you can only change it within the same base as it was shot at. So if you shoot it at ISO 400, you can change it from anywhere between 100 and 1000 in POST. At the native ISOs, you will see a pretty good balance between highlight latitude and shadow detail in terms of dynamic range. When going lower or higher than the native ISO, you will actually shift how much dynamic range you have either above or below middle grey. And the fact that this camera has dual native ISO simply means that you have a reset point. When you're shooting at ISO 1000, you've pushed the low base as far as you can. But once you go up to 1250, you've actually lowered the high base. But we'll get more detailed on its effect on dynamic range later. So let's talk about the tests instead. I set up two different tests. The first one was in a controlled environment with its focus primarily on noise performance. The second test was set up outdoors with a bright sky to see how ISO affects the image when we have a lot of bright highlights. When testing the ISO performance of a camera, I think it's very important to actually have a properly exposed image at each ISO. So I didn't just feed the sensor the same amount of light and then raise the ISO. I exposed every shot correctly by compensating with the shutter. I didn't use the aperture because I didn't want an aperture change to affect the image. So if I raised the ISO by one stop when going from ISO 200 to ISO 400, I then lowered it back down by using a shutter of 90 degrees instead of 180 degrees. This way every ISO is properly exposed and we can actually compare them to each other. Both tests have been shot in Blackmagic RAW. The first one in 8 to 1 and the second one in Q5 both of them at full sensor 4K DCI. So for these tests I won't be telling you what the acceptable noise levels are, I'll leave that up to you. But after each test I will give you just my general thoughts and conclusions. But let's roll the first test and I'll see you afterwards. 
as you can see in this test, within a given ISO base, a lower ISO means less noise. But it's not the ISO setting per se that's making the images cleaner. It's the fact that when we're exposing for a lower ISO, we have to let more light into the camera. And more light reaching the sensor will improve the signal to noise ratio and therefore will get cleaner images. It's not the ISO setting in itself that shifts the dynamic range. It's the fact that when we light for ISO 200 compared to ISO 800, we have to let a lot more light into the sensor. And therefore, in this case, we will have more dynamic range in the shadows. In other words, less noise. But since this camera has dual native ISO, the statement about a lower ISO meaning less noise is only true within a given base ISO. Because when we go from ISO 1000 to ISO 1250, something happens. We went up in ISO, but somehow the image got much cleaner. This relates back to what I said earlier. When we're using ISO 1000, we're pushing the native ISO 400 up to its max setting. But when we switch over to ISO 1250, instead we're using the native 3200 and then pushing it back down all the way to its lowest setting. And I think that really demonstrates one of the amazing opportunities with the dual native ISO of this camera. But in this test we didn't really have any highlights in the image, and therefore couldn't really tell the effects on highlight latitude. So let's go to the second test where we instead have an exterior scene with a bright sky. For this one I didn't go through the entire ISO range of the second base. I went through the low base and then also went to ISO 1250 where we switch over to the high base, but I didn't really see any point of keep going after that. Switching from ISO 1000 to 1250 will tell us what happens when we switch from the low base to the high base. And from ISO 1250 and onwards, the effects on highlight latitude should progress in the same manner as ISO 100 to ISO 1000. As well as in a real world environment, a outdoor scene with a bright sky is probably more suitable to be exposed at the low base, which is native at 400, compared to the high base, which is native at 3200. But here's the test. As you can see in this test as well, lower ISO means less noise, within a given base of course, but we can also see what it does to the highlights. If we look at ISO 100, the sky and the side of the building is completely blown out, but if we instead look at ISO 800, we still retain all that information. If we go from ISO 1000 to 1250, we go back to something that looks more like ISO 100, and that's because both ISO 100 and ISO 1250 are the lowest settings in their respective circuits. But if we stick to looking at the results within the low base, higher ISO means we retain more highlight information. Again, this isn't about the actual ISO setting on the camera, it's about the amount of light we let into the sensor. When exposing for ISO 800, we let in 1 eighth the amount of light compared to ISO 100, and it's the fact that we let in less light that allows the sensor not to overexpose the highlights. This makes more sense if we look at the way RAW works. If we take the clip that was properly exposed at ISO 100 and then change the ISO in post to ISO 800, we don't magically gain back all that highlight information. Instead we're now just overexposing the entire image by three stops. And that's because it's the amount of light reaching the sensor when exposing for a specific ISO that actually affects the dynamic range. 
if we were to change the ISO of both the ISO 100 clip and the ISO 800 clip back to its native of 400, we would then have one clip that would be two stops overexposed and one clip that is one stop underexposed. And that's essentially how the ISO operates in the camera. Shift the ISO down and you're basically overexposing the sensor, giving you cleaner shadows. Shift the ISO up and you're basically underexposing the sensor, giving you more room in the highlights. Assuming you're exposing for that ISO, of course. Notice I said over underexposing the sensor, not the image. Because then the ISO setting brings back the exposure to neutrally exposed image. The camera always captures the full dynamic range. What you're doing when you're changing the ISO is basically shifting where middle grey is placed within that range. But Magic actually includes a dynamic range chart in the manual for the camera. And as you can see, at the native ISOs we have a pretty good balance between highlights and shadows. When we shift the ISO down, we allocate more dynamic range below middle grey. And when we shift it up, we have more dynamic range above middle grey. So if you're trying to determine at what ISO to shoot at, remember the native ISOs. But if you're shooting a dark scene with a lot of shadows, it can actually be beneficial to shoot it at a lower ISO. And if you don't have enough light to properly expose the image at ISO 1 or 200, that's where the second native ISO comes in. You can go to ISO 1250 and voila, you have a very clean image, but you don't need nearly as much light to properly expose the image compared to ISO 1 or 200. And if you're interested in seeing more about the dynamic range of the camera, I'm currently working on a latitude and dynamic range test, so make sure to subscribe. But that pretty much wraps it up for this video. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see some more, and I'll see you next time.